everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this session on the role of cities <coughs> in promoting peace. I'm very honored to uh, invite here to Reykjavik uh, Mayor Johanna Vartainen from Helsinki, Finland, and Ar Andrei Sadovi from Lviv, Ukraine, as well as Daur Bjergetson, Mayor of Reykjavik. Welcome. Um, we are here to talk about peace, of course, but sometimes peace is not a choice. And for Andrei, that was not a choice in February of 2022, when Russia invaded his country. And I'd like to start by asking you, um, how do you respond as a city government when that happens? And, and how do you prepare your citizens, not only to thrive and survive during war, but also maybe to prepare for the future and peace? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It is great honor uh, for me to uh, speak to you. Uh, Lviv, capital of culture of Ukraine, a very beautiful city. 11 years ago, Lviv hosted European football championship, a lot of festivals. But Russian invasion totally changed my life, life my citizens, and life in our world. Let me give you a few examples. Five million internally displaced people passed through Lviv during the Russian invasion. We had days when Lviv hosted two million IDPs per day. It's not possible, but every Lviv citizens open door and every family hosted IDPs. As my family hosted IDPs from Zaporizhia. And before Russian invasion, we uh, prepare location for IDPs. In uh, totally, we prepare 500 uh, municipal location, and we rebuild this location. All school, theaters, uh, kindergartners, labor, uh, hosted IDPs. It's a very special uh, time uh, for me, but before Russian invasion, we had a very interesting uh, seminar uh, together with a Great Britain uh, specialist. Uh, resilience. And we uh, talked about different emergency situation. And before war, I gave order my uh, energy department uh, change situation in city. But all time I uh, had information from media about Russian attack, Russian attack, Russian attack. And Lviv demonstrate a huge resilience. We uh, gave life for new citizens. And today, Lviv hosted 150,000 IDPs. These people from uh, Mariupol, Melitopol, Skadovsk. And this community uh, won't uh, come back to home. But we expect next step our uh, counter offensive. Uh, next very important moment. After Russian invasion, we uh, started hosted wounded. Our municipal hospital hosted 50,000 wounded. Children, women, elderly people, and Ukrainian soldiers. Every day we prepare new location for wounded. But together with Mayor of Reykjavik, we built in Lviv a unique ecosystem of humanity and broken. I am not doctor. But I must think about surgery good quality, about temporary permanent prosthetics, 
about psychological, physical, social rehabilitation. We uh, start building special accommodation for wounded IDPs in my city. We look for new job for our veterans. There's a lot, a lot of different problem. But my citizens demonstrate maximum resilience and maximum uh, support uh, our initiative. This uh, war <coughs> totally changed our life, but we believe in our victory. And every day I think about current situation and I think about future. We must, we must, and support your countries, support Reykjavik, support Helsinki, very important for us. This support give new energy for survive. It is very important for me. Thank you. Well, Tauer, here in Iceland, we um, are not experiencing the threat of war um, as much or at all, uh, but um, you are always looking for ways and how you can support each other as city government, city leaders, because many say the action happens on the municipality level. That's where it happens quicker than maybe on the state level. What, what have you been thinking about how you can support or um, promote peace, not only in Ukraine, but in the world today? Well, some years ago, it, it would have been kind of a, a stretch to have even a plenary on the responsibility of cities for peace. Uh, not in the sense that cities haven't been talking about peace. We've been in an international network uh, based in Japan, connected to the nuclear threat uh, for decades, actually. Uh, but we were actually discussing during lunch that uh, Russia's brutal invasion into Ukraine kind of changed that uh, worldview of mayors in the Nordic countries and uh, in the Baltic as, as well, uh, dramatically. So the, the Nordic uh, mayors have been in close contact through the years uh, and had a bit of contact through COVID, but after the invasion, we started uh, meeting on a more regular basis, even than in COVID actually, uh, which is uh, unexpected really. And uh, instead of kind of the service delivered, we were talking about security issues and external threats and how to respond uh, not only support uh, cities in Ukraine and Ukraine with, with words, uh, but also how the cities were preparing for uh, refugees mm -hmm. from Ukraine and partly elsewhere. Uh, but also kind of through that, uh, we experienced the, the enormous shift in opinions and, uh, and strategy, if you like, uh, policy when it comes to Finland and, and Sweden and, and, uh, and a part of this is kind of uh, the situation of the Nordic in the world. Uh, suddenly uh, the Nordic countries are all NATO countries, uh, hopefully formally soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but this also kind of shows us the vulnerability. I, I want to actually congratulate Andre and the mayors of Ukraine, they have shown both resilience and uh, uh, as, as Ukraine as a, as a whole, but the cities, and, and I had the, the pleasure and honor of visiting Lviv earlier this year, and it's amazing to see how people uh, are trying to kind of get on with life. Uh, the schools are open, although you tragically see the kind of bags of sand in the windows changing the ground floor into shelters uh, from bombs. Uh, but so kind of 
You, you, you're left feeling that your words of support are quite empty in the grave situation, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also think about a lot of things kind of internationally. Uh, how a part of this whole situation is kind of questions about is the US supporting? Is it not? Will, will Trump change everything? And and kind of for the continent of Europe, this raises a lot of questions of kind of uh, what Europe needs to do looking forward. Uh, does cities have uh, a role in that? I'm not sure, but cities are fundamentally responsible for their citizens. And that is, uh, does not kind of uh, the citizens born there, but the citizens living there. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I always say, or very often say, I mean, we, we may be born in different places, but we're all kind of citizens of Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've been now receiving more refugees than ever before. And, and so it's all part of a new reality for cities. Well, talking about new realities, uh, you are now the mayor of the capital city of the newest member of NATO, um, but you're from a country that maybe was neutral out of necessity, and war has always loomed large. How has this war changed the way that you look at security in, in Finland, in Helsinki in particular? And, um, and how do, because Finns are famous for preparing for war in, in a deep way, like with shelters, we have almost none here, you have many of them. How do you think about this situation now evolving and, and, and it, like Dao was saying, the threat of uh, a regime change maybe again in the US with Trump and everything changing now that you've gone to the West? Well, uh, it's a, <clears throat> there's a kind of paradox or contradiction there in as much as there has been, after the Russian aggression, as Dagur points out, a huge change or reorientation of Finnish foreign policy, mm -hmm. since it had always, after the Second World War and during the Cold War, it was based on having a trustful and friendly relationship with the Russian leadership. Uh, and that has changed. Now, now we are part of the Western alliance and that special relationship with Russia is gone. But as to the hard security and military doctrine, not so much has changed, because even through those years of being in friendly terms with the Soviet Union and Russia, then Finland was never naive about military capacity. So they, the Finnish leadership always thought that, well, it's nice to have them as friends, but it's better to have a big army as well. <laughs> So, and it's easier to, to, to stay in friendly terms. And so Finland has always had a, a decent military capacity. Mm -hmm. so I have, now they have shown by some statistics that fi the Finnish uh, sort of, the reservists and the professional army, it's a bit like the, 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 the percentual share of, of soldiers in Finland is about the same as in the ancient Sparta in Greece. So that Finland has always had that capacity, big army big of reservists, big artillery. And, uh, and in that respect, n not so much has changed, in fact. So these resources will now be part of, the, of NATO's command structures, and it will surely be very, very complicated, and, and we don't know yet how that will, how that will be reorganized. But uh, as to that basic commitment to, to, to having a capacity, not so much has changed. And something that, that's uh, evoked a lot of interest in other countries and in NATO countries as well is that Finland, as a very small country neighboring, neighbor to Russia, has had to think hard about mobilizing the entire society. Uh, security-wise, so that it's not only having an, an army, it's about having, yes, a system of shelters for everybody, underground shelters, but then also having a kind of civil organization so that there are these, uh, these famous national defense courses where three times every year 
a bunch of top civil servants, top business, business people, some academics, some media, they undergo a, a, a national defense course so that everybody is, that all elites are instructed about the military doctrines and how we should act, what we should do in times of crisis. So that creates a, creates a sort of networking system within civil society that supports the, the military capacity. So Have that, you ever uh, thought about this focus on security? Um, because we are now at a peace conference and there's been a lot of talk about, of course, it's choice. And if we are constantly thinking of the enemies and preparing us militarily and otherwise for an attack or something, then maybe that will happen and therefore we have this constant evolving of, of war and, and erupting of war and aggression against each other. Because you, you're describing like the Finnish pre preparedness, but maybe it's more about preparing for the worst and not for the best and, and, and thinking of ways for peace. Okay. Oh, Is yes. that a discussion I mean, that you have in Finland? Well, uh, not really, I would say. I, I don't know whether other Finns agree on that, but being a very small nation with a 1,400 kilometers frontier to, to border to, to Russia, then you, you cannot afford being naive about that. And the, the old Romans, they had this maxim of, if you want to, to have peace, then be prepared for war. Uh, and this has coexisted simultaneously with this rhetoric of being in friendly terms with our great eastern neighbor. And it, that way of working served as well during the Cold War, but now it's a different, different world. And it's a, we don't know what will happen, but, but uh, I wouldn't say that this uh, doctrine for preparedness would sustain militaristic attitudes. I wouldn't say so. Okay. But of course, I might be partial. But cities, um, I guess, at their best are places where people can live, coexist in harmony. Their worst, the opposite. Um, that, that's where the seeds of discord and disharmony um, grow, especially when you have segregation. And all cities now are becoming more fluid in terms of the people living there. People are on the move as never before. They're fleeing conflict, um, climate crisis. Um, looking for opportunities, economic and otherwise. You were talking about, Andre, uh, how many IDPs that you have had internally displaced people. Um, how, how, what are you doing to make sure that you don't create like two cities or segregated cities and that people are living together um, in harmony, <laughs> if, if, if that's possible? Okay, we've hosted 150,000 IDPs and 30,000 my citizens today near front line. And I must think about support Ukrainian army. Mm -hmm. I must think uh, about support our wounded. 80% uh, our wounded, it is not my citizens. It is citizens from uh, different uh, cities. And uh, yesterday I had a meeting with uh, company of Sur, mm -hmm. and we have idea build a huge manufacturing in view. Uh, 90,000 Ukrainian people today need new prosthetics. And every day increase. And we won't build manufacture, and we need high-level quality prosthetics. And uh, very famous Japanese architecture Shigeru Ban in this moment make a project surgically building for our ecosystem of humanity and broken, 25,000 square meters. This very special material, very famous uh, project, this new heart, our uh, hospital. Our hospital 180,000 square meters, 4,000 medical uh, specialists. And together with IBRD, we uh, want to build special tram line from uh, center city to our hospital, but a lot of people with disability, and we must uh, rebuild our city. And all time, we think about different innovation uh, project. Uh, we uh, uh, 
invest money, but we won't have good quality result. A lot of companies from East are allocated to Lviv. And we have in Lviv a good economic situation, but we feel responsibility about all countries. Mm -hmm. It is very, very special moment for me, but I am optimist. I believe in my city, I believe in our country, I believe in uh, our victory. But uh, our uh, victory have uh, two parts. One part, uh, they occupied our territory. Next part, rebuild our country. If we want to rebuild our country, we uh, must make smart, uh, good quality decision. We need experience from Helsinki. We need experience from Reykjavik. We need experience from uh, different smart democratic uh, cities. Uh, but we understand next reality. Uh, Russia was, is, and will all time source of threat for Ukraine, for Finland, for Norway, for all democratic countries. But all time, I uh, have a very, very specific moment. Current situation, okay. Future, I must think about future. This our uh, uh, bedrock. Uh, uh, program uh, Green City. Before war we uh, started renovate city, but today we make next step during war. It is not possible. It's possible. If we believe, you must make very strong uh, step. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, um, Andre was talking about reaching out to other cities and mm -hmm. see what uh, they have to offer in terms of, of resources and also learning about things. But I also want to ask you if you could talk about that a little bit, but also about um, what we're doing to make sure that there's not an, a, a double society, that we are not bringing in different people from other countries and creating a dual society and therefore maybe a hotbed for future conflict. Yes, first for the city and the cooperation of cities, uh, we, we've seen increased international activity kind of between cities and municipalities in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, very much focused actually on climate change and, and kind of single issue that they all share in common. Uh, what we've seen uh, regarding Ukraine is that Ukrainian cities have uh, to, in a scale we haven't seen before, reached out to other cities, both old partners, but also created new, like Reykjavik and Lviv are, are new sister cities now. We had kind of left the sister city uh, concept, but we kind of revitalized it through this. And, uh, and, uh, and Zelensky has referred to the city as, uh, and the mayors as his second army, not directly active in war, but active in kind of keeping life and the economy and everything working during uh, war. Uh, cities have uh, a huge role and res responsibility when it comes to refugees. And you're totally right that although we are all uh, asking and praying for uh, peace, and the end of war as soon as possible, I think that we have to prepare uh, not only to, to that people from Ukraine will stay in our city and other cities for some time, and also within Ukraine, but uh, I think that uh, the years to come uh, will mean uh, increase in refugees in the world, also because of climate crisis, but also because of war and instabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the world needs to be better on that front, uh, dealing with real integration. That's about uh, how we plan our cities. It's about how we build new housing. It's about how we integrate children, especially in the schools. But it's also how we reach to the parents of those children. And I actually think that the working market is uh, a main tool of integration to remember that it's through the workplace and, and, and work and, and your own earnings that you
kind of uh, become a part of our society. So, so cities won't do this alone. They have to work with national governments. And national governments have to work across borders because what we've been seeing in Europe, for example, is the clash of national governments because of uh, an even burden of uh, immigration and, and, and refugees. And, uh, and we have to be frank about it. It's, it costs money, it costs attention, but it's uh, also what we need for the future. We need more people, we need uh, uh, integrated uh, working markets and, uh, and cities. The, the reason the world is flocking to cities, now 50% live in cities, at the end of the century, 85 or 90% will live in cities, is because cities are the most amazing invention in human history. Uh, they are the place where people meet, where they exchange knowledge and change uh, uh, things they sell or buy and kind of makes a lot of things easier and more dynamic than other places. So I think that although these tasks are in the hands of cities, the opportunities also lie there. But th there's a lot to be done and a lot to be learned also from other cities, but uh, also innovate by ourselves. What is Helsinki doing? Do you have, have you had an influx of refugees or people moving there recently or things changing? I mean, the Nordic countries, and I'm ex I expect the Viv to some extent, were uh, for a long time have been homogenous societies, um, but it's changing rapidly. And how are you dealing with that? Well, uh, yes, Helsinki is a growing city and, and uh, fortunately so. And as most Europe, as many European larger cities, it becomes more multilingual, multicultural. And then one key issue for security and the quality of life and society is to make these cities worthwhile to live in and secure for everybody, so that everybody has a stake in, in defending these cities in times of crisis and and wanting to live there. And then there we can learn a lot from each other. One lesson that I have try been trying to promote is this very Helsinki an idea that do not create enclaves, do not create ghettos, try to mix all kinds of people in all parts of the city. I took part in a kind of similar debate, uh, panel debate in, in southern France this summer uh, in Aix-en-Provence. And, <laughs> And this was just after this, those big demonstrations in, in France. And there it turns out, in fact, that one root of these, these malaises, these demonstrations, is the fact that they have created suburbs mm -hmm. which are so ethnically, culturally, politically, socially segregated, as you say, that some people there, they don't feel any feeling of togetherness mm -hmm. with the rest. Yeah. of the city. And this is something that Helsinki has not done everything right, but we have at least tried to, to put all kinds of residential dwellings mm -hmm. in all parts of the city. And then another part of that same, same recipe, of course, is try to, trying to keep the schools and kindergartens of similar quality in all parts of the city, so that somehow the entire city belongs to everybody. There are no places where you never, never go. And this is perhaps the most basic thing for security, because it then, in the long run, it makes the, these cities something that people want to work together in, defend in times of crisis, perhaps, and work for the common good. That's how I see my mm -hmm. job as a mayor. Mm -hmm. You're also working on integrating um, people here in different areas, right? Yeah, yes, we are actually inspired by Helsinki in, uh, in some of that when it comes to housing to, to kind of mix into every kind of infill and, and uh, integrating in, in that way. Uh, as, as many other cities, we have kind of uh, a history that we have to deal with there. Uh, I mean, in the building boom in the 60s, we were kind of uh, building social housing in, in, in just a few districts and not all. So now we're trying to learn from history and, and, 
and develop a, a mixed city. But uh, I love the Finns because to every question they always say, first you have to plan, then you have to plan, <laughs> and then you have to plan some more. <laughs> yeah. And it's really, I mean, to, to dig into those numbers, to dig into the realities you're dealing with and how you are affecting it with new development and, and new things and new inhabitants. Uh, this can be done uh, well and this can be done less well. Mm -hmm. but but let me just say that yeah. Helsinki is not perfect in any way. We see increasing segregation as well in Helsinki, but we try to combat it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the issue. But like in, in times of war, planning kind of goes out the window a little bit. You have had to move very fast in Lviv to find housing for the 150,000 internally displaced that you have within your city right now. How have you been doing that? And, and has that gone? Are there cultural differences between people in different areas of Ukraine? Hmm. Uh, good question. A lot of uh, my citizens think that uh, our new citizens, internally displaced peoples, uh, change our cities. Mm -hmm. And I think we received new energy, we received uh, new experience, and uh, today this community uh, uh, help open for us, our countries, mm -hmm. but uh, new uh, IDPs uh, go to our school, and we have good collaboration between uh, children, and uh, we must make huge uh, job for uh, unite our uh, uh, people in in Ukraine. We have uh, different uh, history. But Lviv and West Ukraine, all time was Europe. Uh, uh, East Ukraine have a huge influence from Russia. Today, uh, situation completely different. Today, we understand our mission. Today, Ukrainian people protect democratic values, and uh, we need uh, new skills. We need new experience. We need uh, new uh, supervision. Ukrainian government have uh, good collaboration uh, with different government, Finland, uh, your country, and different countries. But a huge reserve for development, collaboration, uh, cities and cities. Mm. And we have good uh, example in, in Lviv, we invite uh, small uh, cities, uh, mayor, in three, four days, we, uh, we have a special uh, residential, architecture residential, medical residential, uh, ecological residential, and we show our uh, good example, uh, which uh, gave uh, good, uh, tangible result. And we need new experience, but today, I uh, saw a good quality uh, school in Reykjavik. It's an amazing school. Uh, I won't have in uh, my city very similar school, but I know about a uh, good example, about a uh, new level uh, education in Finland. I, I knew this uh, uh, experience for my city, but uh, first of all, Lviv received a good example. Next, we share our experience. But we have a very similar situation in Unbroken. We built Unbroken uh, in Lviv, yes, rehabilitation, socialization. And next, we share our experience for different uh, cities in, in Ukraine and, and world. Collaboration. Today, we need uh, more level uh, collaboration. It is. It's, it is it is good key for 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 future. I think that's a great message uh, to leave on a collaboration and, and moving forward. Um, are there any final thoughts that you would like to have? 
on, on where cities might be going in their role in promoting peace? I, I just wanted to add uh, uh, another angle which is uh, very much discussed within Europe and probably elsewhere that kind of the, the funds of international uh, organizations and, and funds for rebuilding like Ukraine uh, uh, to channel them through cities and city governments, not always through national governments and the politics of national governments. I think that you have to work on the local level for solutions, but also in the rebuilding, because then uh, you ensure that the money, uh, which will never be kind of too much of, I think it will be scarce, mm -hmm. uh, it will go to where it is needed most. Uh, and uh, through a vision of kind of rebuilding stronger. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, I, I want to just underline that cities are a part of the solution and the future and also in the rebuilding in, in many places in the world. If I, <clears throat> and that's so true, and if I might just add to that same line of thought that this uh, Russian attack on Ukraine has really mobilized European cities. Mm -hmm. So uh, this happens bilaterally. The city next to Helsinki Espo, they have contributed in remote learning for the children of uh, school children of Griviri. And now we are currently discussing a new a, a friendship agreement with Nipro, whereby we would help them in, in various ways. It might not be enormous. We are just a middle-sized city, but this happens in all sort of, all these European cities are matched with Ukrainian cities. And the Eurocities network, which is a sort of EU network, they now try to obtain EU funds to, to, to sustain that kind of multitude of bilateral bilateral relationships and this will probably and I believe I hope and I, I to some extent believe that as Doug Dakur says that will be a big positive force. It's also a, a very sort of simple and mundane reason for working like this is that uh, it might be easier to mobilize politically this aid for a Ukrainian city if it is concrete. If I say to my citizens that now we will help to build, rebuild this kindergarten in, in that Ukrainian city, instead of just giving money to the budget, mm -hmm. which is anonymous, and we don't know where that money will, will end. But somehow <laughs> creating these city-city contacts might be just a politically. It harmonizes way. with the conversation that was here before, where they were saying that the UN permanent um, I guess <laughs> doesn't system that the UN will come into countries uh, doesn't work. That it needs to be more on a, like like you're saying on a targeted area. And I know that that's what you're working on with like when you're talking to us or yourself and you're trying to do specific things for your people because you know what they need mm -hmm. and and what is most needed. So the, I, I yeah. actually lead lead a cities initiative within the OECD called the Champions and Mayors for Inclusive Growth. And it's interesting that OECD is kind of uh, a pioneer in this among international institutions, uh, being the only place where you have this dialogue with national governments and city governments. And OECD was born out of, as you know, the Marshall mm -hmm. assistance to Europe. It's kind of born out of a strategy of how to build. And I actually think that the UN needs a much more kind of punchy city network, uh, if you like. Uh, the European Union uh, should uh, channel more funds through cities, etc. So a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I believe in our victory. You must believe in our victory. Only together we must build our victory. Never give up. Only victory. Thank you.
Okay. Well, I'm now very happy to introduce Jeppe Albers, um, who leads the organization Nordic Safe Cities. And he's going to give us some insight into the global outlook of Nordic cities. Um, thank you very much, Eva, and uh, thank you all for having me here. Um, uh, I will spend the next uh, couple of minutes talking a little bit about the, uh, as the uh, Minister of Nordic Cooperation from Iceland said, um, internal peace building in the Nordic region. I have worked the past decade inside the Nordic region, uh, and I will not deal as much with the foreign policy of cities as we previously heard. I am uh, I'm quite humble uh, to stand here and talk about democracy and values again. Uh, as, a, as a northerner, as a Copenhagener, when we have representatives from Afghanistan and Lviv and Iran and other places uh, torn by war and not peace. So with that in mind, I offer perspectives from across the, the Nordic region. Um, fortunately, as we have heard uh, over the day, during the day, the Nordics remain a relatively small and peaceful corner of the globe. Uh, we are characterized by uh, more trust, less inequality and more social cohesion than most parts of the world. So that is, uh, I would say, a, a good recipe for peaceful coexistence. Um, as has also been stated by, I would say, maybe 90% of the people from the Nordic region on this stage today, uh, we can owe this peace to our democratic ideals, equality, freedom of speech, trust, respect for each other, human rights, and to our democratic distribution models. And all these ingredients has kept our countries relatively safe, secure, peaceful, and prosperous for all for the past decade. Yet, uh, although we are up here uh, in, in Harpa, in this uh, lovely, uh, maybe the most peaceful country in the world, uh, our democracies and the belief in democracy up here in the Nordic countries is not as strong as it was just a few years ago. We have also heard this parade of darkness that I'm just going to repeat, unfortunately, a little bit from our region here. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, new technologies, disinformation and online attacks that we don't know how to deal with hybrid threats, mix of extreme ideologies, normalization of polarizing conspiracy theories, everyday discrimination and racism online, and harassment against politicians, public leaders, and youth, so they stay away from democracy. These are a bit of the kind of uh, things that are luring uh, and threatening the, the foundation of, of democracy. Um, it's, it's a stormy day outside of Harper, and it's a bit stormy times as well in the horizon, some of these dark clouds. Um, in light of this, also in light of the conversation on stage earlier, it is uh, timely, and I've also seen that in, in our city network. We're one of many city networks, but I can see an appetite to work closer together, particularly around safety, security, uh, social cohesion in the Nordic region. Also to try to build new models of democracy and trust and social cohesion. We heard some of them here from, from particularly the idea of the, uh, of the mixed city is something people are very much looking to, city of Helsinki, for also in my network. Um, that's a little bit what we work on, what we aspire to do in, in the Nordic region, uh, to try to s shape and safeguard the new models of democracy with um, around 25 cities, including Helsinki and, and Reykjavik. And um, going a little bit off script, uh, this is a conversation also about Nordic collaboration. I, I have to say, I think there's a lot we can learn in terms of peace building and, uh, and enabling democracy uh, from Iceland because uh, in, in judging on this uh, forum as well, uh, you have to dare to lead and use the power of imagination to create a future you want. And this is perfect as we have uh, kids coming in the room in the middle of, of the speech. Um, I think uh, Iceland particularly, I very much admire uh, the ingenuity, the ability to deal with the unexpected. Maybe it's something to do with the weather. Uh, the, the way about getting things done, we heard from the mayor previously, going directly to a problem while thinking big. This is not a traditional uh, Nordic way of approaching societal problems. It's some kind of blend between an entrepreneur and other Nordic approaches. And this is very much needed when you need to create big visions for new societies and for democracies. I will offer you in, in this uh, charade of darkness uh, three pathways of light. I think we should follow, and this is also based on the data and the experiences from across uh, 25 cities. The first one, and I think that's the most important one, we must take out the brush of love and marinate kids and youth in democracy early on and from all parts of society. We must promote and instill democratic values and culture in youth and work with them 
uh, so they can shape the new versions of solidarity and peace. And that means we cannot just write a youth inclusion and engagement in a forgotten policy documents. We have to work on the ground with young people, and that is very difficult. Uh, secondly, um, we uh, must dare to build a digital democratic resilience um, and build safer digital cities and democracies. Um, one of the things I have seen over the past uh, seven years here is uh, when the conversation turns to the digital arena, uh, disinformation, conspiracy, we meet and we share ignorance, to be a bit frank. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of app, uh, uh, um, need to, to really transform the way we work on building uh, digital resilience, trust, dialogue, prevention, on our phone, in the digital arena, um, as we've done for decades here in the streets, in the schools, in civil society, not replace it, add a layer. Also, I think the, the Nordic way of approaching this is, is quite unique. It's, it's, it's usually bottom-up with a high level of civil society engagement. We cannot wait for EU service acts or digital platforms to do the job. We can do it ourselves. Uh, take lead and unleash civil society, digital volunteers to act on large-scale conspiracy theories and fight back with beautiful disagreement against hate and values undermining a safe democracy for all. Also, what is needed, and I think cities have a chance in, in doing that, is pioneering some of the new digital prevention concepts, generative AI and tech for peace. Uh, it is possible, I've seen that actually from a lot of work in Sweden, to engage and de-escalate digital conflicts and hereby preventing violence and harms both on and off side the screen. Thirdly and finally, um, we must embrace diversity and create a city for all, and I think that resembles the finale of the, the mayors on stage uh, earlier. Uh, and it has two aspects, to stay firm and, and respect the rights of everyone, uh, not tolerate discrimination and everyday racism to newcomers or minorities. It might be small things, but it divides us and blurs the boundaries of what is accepted, normal, and what is extreme. In, uh, in the network I work in, we have witnessed attacks on an LQBT nightclub in Oslo last summer and spent a lot of time with the city of Oslo working on this. And we're also seeing an increase in hate speech online against the Muslim community and the LGBTQIA community that is motivating hate crimes and can lead into violence. I know this is also the case here in Reykjavik, but you're not alone. It's the same uh, things happening across uh, many cities. Um, so we must reject this discrimination, but also work against segregation and invest to grow mixed cities and trust between people and communities. These were a little bit of the, the three paths I want to highlight from, from our work and three hopefully a little bit more positive ways uh, you can see for yourself in this uh, democratic uh, uh, dark times. Um, and hopefully the Nordics, by traveling on some of these paths, can remain a beacon of inspiration, perhaps for some of the other places and generations uh, in the world where there are that you are not fortunate to have this peace. And please let us know if there's anything our network can do uh, for those of you who, who feel like uh, connecting. I would invite, finally, all of you present today uh, who live in the Nordic land, in the peaceful Nordic lands, to join us in Nordic Take Safe Cities uh, to invest your time, your power, your hope, and your imagination to safeguard the Nordic democracies together. And I will end with the words of the uh, Icelandic uh, Minister for Nordic Cooperation and say, if I had a glass, I would say to 200 years of more peace in our region. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, I now have the honor of uh, announcing the, uh, the prizes in the Children Art Competition, Peaceful Towns 2023. It's held by Mayors of Peace, uh, an international cooperation of mayors uh, that it hosted in uh, uh, Japan in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, each member city can se select up to five pieces, uh, pieces each uh, for category one, which is age six to 10, and category two, which is age uh, 11 to 15. Uh, we were 
participating for the first time in the city of Reykjavik and this part of the cooperation and got 600 drawings from 19 schools. We are very proud of that and very proud of the uh, quality of the submissions. Uh, I have one documentary photo of the jury at work and I want to uh, thank the jury for their good work uh, on this, but uh, I will not dwell longer with this. Uh, I know there is excitement in the room and we go to category one, uh, age six to ten. And first, it is from Vogaskole, Antoni Petrovsky Toshinsky. And we have some prizes for everyone, a certificate and And uh, then we have Empla Rune Williams Doctor, uh, fifth grade from Borgaskoli. Then we have Elmar Hrab Kjartansson, Þriðibekkur, Foldaskóli. And then we have Hrabtina Sigurðardóttir, fourth grade, Vogaskóli. Then we have Malfríð Solnes Friðriksdóttir, fimmtu bekku Melaskóli. And then there's category 2, 11 to 15, Viktoria Átna Danilak. Uh, Polska Skolnum, Ottenberg. And we have Margaret Mjöll Sindradóttir, Tíundabekk Ingunarskóla. And we have Thordis Edda Pálmadóttir, Sjöndubekkur Langholtskóli.
En Bjartur Aðalsteinsson, áttubekkur Hagaskóli. En fælni Hrafnildur Tinna Gömundsdóttir, Antunberg Hlíðarskóla. Congratulations uh, til hamingjukrakkar, ótrúlega vel gert hjá okkur, frábæra myndir og þetta er sérstakur friðabrúsi sem er hannaður af Yoko Ono. Uh -huh. So let's give them once more a hand.